Thanks you all for being here. And this is PyCon Day 3 keynote, uh, Artificial Intelligence in Finance. And this session is about different important aspects in finance field. And speaker Yves is a uh, adjunct professor of financial engineering at University of Miami Business School now. And he's a founder in Python Crunch and AI machine and focus on programming trending and uh, finance data science. And he's also the author of the AI in finance, Python for uh, finance. And let's give, it, give him a big hand and enjoy it. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Hope you all fit on the third day here, PyCon Taiwan. Um, it's a little bit loud. Maybe we can reduce it a bit to avoid the feedback. Um, here, just one second before I get started. I want to just make sure that we have it all kind of like recorded as well from my end. Or maybe the feedback can indeed be. <laughs> because I, I'm inclined to speak kind of loud usually, so therefore feedback might be something of importance. Yeah, first of all, big thank you to the organizers for organizing a great event here in Taipei, Taiwan. And thanks for inviting me to give a keynote here about artificial intelligence and finance. My name is Eve. I'm founder and managing partner of the Python Quants and also founder and CEO of the AI machine. I will show you a few slides that introduce what we do so that you get a little bit of a better background in this regard. And artificial intelligence everywhere, we can say everything has become AI first um, and finance in particular so. Although, to some extent, we must say, and that's my serious opinion, it's still something like a, a blind man's game or blind man's buff. So many, many people, many, many institutions are trying to apply it in many different fields, but I th think it's still a nascent discipline. And most of it, what I present today is, uh, my opinion is really from So, well, I think this works better now. <laughs> uh, it's driven by my own experience, and these are my opinions. Other people in the industry might have different opinions, uh, but I'm not shy to present and argue for mine. So let me get into my slide deck, quick introduction. Um, if you're interested what I'm doing, what I've been doing over the last couple of years, just visit my personal page. Hilpish.com, you find there not that many personal things, but many, many, um, uh, many, many talk, resources, podcasts, videos, etc. So it's all about Python for finance and not that much about myself. And what I've been up to over the last you know, almost 15 years, I can say, is the Python for Quants company that I founded already in 2005. Back then, we couldn't really make a living out of Python for finance. It wasn't that popular. People were even arguing that Python and finance don't go along quite well. Um, but these days, the biggest companies in our industry are using Python as a strategic platform, so I'm pretty happy um, that it turned out that way. The iMachine is our recent project and company where we uh, develop a platform for the standardized deployment of algorithmic trading strategies and those are in general powered by AI. And I've also recently taken on a role as a professor, adjunct professor at Miami Business School teaching. You guessed it, Python for Finance, to incoming uh, Master of Finance students. So at the company, you see here, what we do is all centered around Python for Finance. We provide trainings online, offline. We run events with our partners, for example, Fitch Learning, the CKF Institute. A bootcamp, for example, is coming up in November um, about Python for algorithmic trading. We provide services to hedge funds, banks, 
for example, in the form of customized trainings as well, but also development services. We run a platform with some 25,000 users on it. We have open sourced a couple of financial libraries and packages, and I've written a bunch of books that I will show you in a minute. So our core uh, online training offering these days is the University Certificate in Python for Algorithmic Trading. So this has grown uh, uh, tremendously and I'm pre pretty happy about it. The topic has become so popular and when we got started there was just a little bit of AI in it, a little bit of machine learning here and there. Now that's at the core of what we do. We even have a full class going over 12 weeks actually which is uh, only concerned with AI and finance. So it's a 16 week program, 150 plus hours of instruction. Uh, many, many thousand lines of code because so many people, not only those who are employed on the buy side in our industry, but also individuals that might have been doing some day trading in the past, now go algorithmic and want to um, automate their trading strategies. And Python, I think, is the perfect uh, platform to do that. The iMachine is, as I said before, like a platform for the standardized deployment and execution, of course, for trading strategies, I will uh, say a little bit more towards the end of my um, talk this morning uh, and explain why we have started this project and how far we have come. Um, because to make a long story short, people usually are having an easy time to come up with trading ideas and in Python you might formulate an algorithmic trading strategy even with some AI included. Uh, let's say with 150 lines of code, but if you want to deploy that strategy in a robust and reliable fashion, maybe you would need 15,000 lines of code or more. And this is what most people can't really accomplish. They have their financial background, they know a little bit of Python, have their data science background maybe as well, but the deployment and the execution, that's the hard part, that's the big problem. And this is what we solve with the AI machine. So. If you're interested in a short uh, story, short summary, here's the one page um, summary of what we do at, uh, or with the certificate program. Um, you see also here in my browser, by the way, the link to the slide deck. The slide deck is uh, public, it's on my server, so hitbish.com slash pycontw.pdf and you have access to all the resources that I'm going to show. My box, I just signed the middle one. Um, the uh, second edition of Python for Finance, which is my best-selling book, for sure it's not Harry Potter, but uh, for a tech book I think it's selling kind of okay. Um, the second edition came out in um, December last year and the first edition four years before that. And these four years um, so many things have happened, have changed and we have seen tremendous progress in our ecosystem and in the industry with regard to the adoption and the usage of uh, uh, Python. It was really like a joy to update the book. Basically, I should say it's an upgrade because we added many, many things like algo trading uh, stuff. We reorganized uh, the book not 200%, but I would say like two thirds have been reorganized. So that's uh, kind of nice. And it's also selling still what I said before, kind of okay. The other two books on the left and on the right hand side with Wiley instead of O'Reilly, they are really quant finance books that make use of Python. So Python usage is not explained. But if you have the middle one, uh, I think you should master the Python code that's presented in the other two. And my new book project, it was mentioned already during the introduction, thanks for that, is Artificial Intelligence and Finance. A big surprise, a Python-based guide. So I'm in the middle of writing it. I've uh, uh, yeah, drafted five chapters, some 170, 80 pages maybe. I'm not progressing as fast as I wanted to, but that's the same thing as with IT projects. You know, you're always ambitious when you get started, but then travel and other stuff comes in between. So, um, but I'm pretty uh, confident that towards the beginning of next year, first half of next year, um, the book will come out and we'll have finished it because. I write uh, more efficiently during winter time than during summer time. I also run a couple of uh, communities. The biggest one is in London, Python for Quant Finance. There we have some uh, close to 3,000 members. Uh, we started more than five years ago there. Uh, Refinitiv is our major sponsor there. We have usually meetups uh, the size of 100 people. 
um, focus, of course, finance, Python, everything around that, more and more over the years, of course, also machine and deep learning. I uh, recently had a talk about deep hatching. So um, we now get these financial terms that rely in part really on the, on the machine learning and AI side. Uh, I also have a group in New York, for example, where the last meeting was in May. For example, so pretty active, try to uh, get back to the community. Even if you're not in one of these places, you can still get a member or meet up and you will might or might benefit from uh, yeah, resources that we share like slide decks and codes, etc. So feel free to do that. So having said that, before I now get into the talk, if if you like to, you can follow me on Twitter. I just tweeted uh, this morning the links to uh, the slide deck and I will also show later on a Jupyter Notebook and there is an HTML version hosted as well. Some interactive visualization. Um, so feel free A to follow me, B to access the slide deck as well as the Jupyter Notebook. So when I present something later on, you will have access to everything. It's all there. Just Search me, look me up on Twitter, DYGH. Python, key skill in finance. So uh, I said it before, when I got started with uh, Python for finance, people said, well, that's ridiculous. You cannot use Python as an interpreted language. It's well too slow um, to accomplish something meaningful in finance. But these days, Python is in the quant and development oriented parts of our industry, a conditio sine qua non. Without this skill, it's pretty hard to land the job. And we have these days some of the biggest Python applications and, and usages in finance. So JP Morgan is among them, among the first adopters, basically. Uh, here the tweet is not really about like the, the major success story, but it's about the problem that once you get beyond a certain uh, size of a project, here 35 million lines of code, and uh, when you read the article, like 1,500 uh, developers contributing to Athena, which is the major risk management and trading platform of JP Morgan, it's hard to migrate. But nevertheless, the first message is here we have one or some of the biggest Python um, driven applications in the financial industry, but on the other hand, of course, uh, next year Python 2.7 will um, uh, yeah, somehow stop, so to say, support will stop, and there are problems, of course, related to that, but nonetheless, I'm more happy that finance has picked up uh, Python in such a strategic manner. And when you read through different articles, again, something here about JP Morgan, what they require, and this is now from my point of view, even more interesting is not from their developers only, it's rather from analysts and, and other roles that usually haven't had any exposure to coding at all, to pick up Python as, again, a key skill. So uh, back in the days, and still today, in, in some corners, dark corners of our industry, people use Excel to, to almost anything. You can come up in the financial industry, but now more and more companies are also using these roles more towards a proper programming and data science oriented um, environment. And here you see on the right hand side the coding training for this year's juniors was based on Python programming. This is 2018. And then later on you can read that next year, this is now 2019, they will add data science, machine learning, and even cloud computing. And again, it's not for the developers here, it's for the investment bankers, analysts, and trading-oriented positions. So pretty interesting that the big companies, and not only like the, the, the boutique-like companies, like hedge funds, require this particular skill. And then there is another um, interesting article from my point of view. This is about masters in finance. When I was teaching in Miami uh, like four weeks ago, I used this a uh, couple of times to repeat the message. It's not about finance anymore. Finance has become not only an applied mathematics discipline, it's also kind of an applied uh, technology discipline. So computer programming skills are becoming a must have. She says, here the quote, don't bother putting Excel or PowerPoint on your resume. So you need to know languages, and in general it is Python as a programming language that you need to know. R, of course, is a good domain-specific language for statistics, but R brings you only that far, and more and more companies migrate from R to Python, migrate from MATLAB to Python, etc., etc. So that's indeed a key skill. 
Um, and this was a message that I repeated over and over to the 200 master of finance students uh, just starting out uh, yeah, their journey in the field. And I hope they will pick up Python a bit more than we just did over the course of two and a half weeks. Data-driven finance. So the, um, my Python for Finance book, uh, the first edition had a different subtitle than the second one. So we changed it for the second one due to this particular topic to mastering data-driven finance because this has become so important in our industry. Um, and when I think back when I was studying, I was like fascinated, even at school, high school or gymnasium as it's called in, in, in Germany, uh, reading the, the financial news in Germany, it's the Handelsblatt, but internationally it's Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and I collected like staples of these daily uh, newspaper editions, but Today, I think we can safely conclude that not too many decisions in, in the financial markets are driven anymore by what people read in the financial newspapers. So whenever they pick up the newspapers, that's already kind of old stuff. It's in a certain sense history. Maybe you try to stay informed and that's a good thing. Yes, but what people do since decades already, we can say, is to have a look at their terminals like Bloomberg or here Refinitiv Icon Terminal. And if you're interested in information about Apple, you usually don't pick up, I don't know, the last 10 financial reports, uh, the last 100 editions of the Financial Times and search for um, some information about Apple. You go to your terminal and you find like in a single spot everything, like from news, background, um, fundamental data, price data, tick data, current data, you find kind of everything, forecasts even. So that's the standard since quite a while. But now there is a new standard that has established itself and that's data driven finance. Because for many, many applications that are real time today in our industry, it's simply not efficient to read anything or to look it up uh, yeah, on a terminal and to, to scroll through endless pages of data. It's rather like that you use let's say Python or some other programming language to this and you hit APIs from which you get all the data that you might require. And here it's a, a tiny example um, based on a Refinitiv icon uh, data API. You see here this is from uh, 28th June this year. It's just for one hour, one hour of data, tick data for Apple and you see there are some 20,500 uh, data points. And who wants to read through that? Who wants to print that? And when we compare this, uh, one hour, 20,000 data points, and think back to the good old days when most of the financial theories have been developed and end of day data was the standard, uh, then we must conclude the following. End of day data means you have roughly 250 trading days per year. So times 10 is 2,500, times four is 10,000. So Apple went public around 1980. Uh, so there are 10,000 end-of-day data points for the Apple stock price. So I speak of close, so you can say, well, there's open, high, low, close for sure. But closing prices, we have 10,000, roughly. So that's a rough estimate. But here on the tick data level, on the real-time level, what's relevant for people acting these days and the machines acting in the markets, we have uh, twice as many data points for a single hour only. And for the machine, it doesn't really matter whether it's 10,000, 20,000, 200,000, 200 million, or 2 billion data points. So the machines are kind of like diligent and fast and crunching these numbers. And you see, there's no human being on earth that would like to get through 20,000 data points. And if you have six trading hours, um, you might get an idea. And then you have the S&P 500 with 500 such stocks and you get a rough idea of what's going on on a daily basis in the markets. The same holds true for news. Um, the big news or the big data companies, we can say, like Bloomberg, the Refinitiv, Dow Jones, roughly consume 1.5 million news articles on a daily basis. So even if you say, well, I nevertheless read the financial newspapers because I want to stay up to date, I want to stay informed, um, the machines are better at that because there's well, well too much and it's coming in on a real-time basis. So um, it's not that you say, well, in the morning at, I don't know, 6 a.m., I pick up my newspaper and that's it. No, it's kind of like a 24-7 thing that's going on. And again, it's roughly 1.5 million such articles on a daily basis.
So maybe not everything is relevant to you, but even if you are able to trim it down, uh, there's still uh, lots of stuff to crunch or left. And here we see another example with regard to the Icon uh, Data API where I search for Tesla as the, the RIC, as it's called in that universe, or Reuters instrument code, and for production and for relatively short um, time interval, some 18 days, something, and you get like first uh, an overview and then you, if you want to go deeper, um, you get the full text. And of course the machines these days are also much, much faster and to many in many instances also much better at going through that many articles. We recently did a project with uh, Dow Jones where we applied natural language processing, sentiment analysis, summary, uh, wet cloud generation, etc. in real time to incoming uh, news articles and, for example, showed an application uh, with regard to crypto-related uh, news and the relationship to uh, Bitcoin prices. So you can do this in real time, you can do this on a large scale and again the machine won't complain when it needs to process 1,000 or 10,000 articles, but for a human being, for an analyst uh, working for a financial institution, I don't know whether 1,000 articles are uh, something that they want to go through, not even doing a month with of time. The Python ecosystem, I think, uh, and you see I'm like a I'm pretty convinced about what we have there is pretty well uh, positioned to master what is required in data driven finance and of course on the other end you need to have like proper APIs that can hit you need to have like the, the yeah, accompanying infrastructure but if you want to work with it Python to a large extent provides you with everything that is needed in this context even if you still want to work with Excel uh, with Excel wings for example you can uh, put the analytical power, the financial power, the uh, yeah, natural language processing power of Python also in your Excel spreadsheet. So that's where we are. And uh, I mentioned now two times the students, and one student mentioned, well, this looks like uh, an interesting future. I said, no, this is not the future, this is where we are already. This is, this is what we have anyways, and a little bit more we have. And the next step, once you have data available, natural next step is AI first finance. What do I mean by that? So, uh, first of all, uh, stepping back a little bit, um, scientific method, what is it? is it? The method of procedure that has characterized natural science since the 17th century, consisting in systematic observation, measurement and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. Um, I think in finance, to some extent, this has been implemented over the, the last, let's say, seven decades, roughly. But where finance people haven't been that strong is in modification of hypothesis. So once something was there, let's say the CAPM or mean variance portfolio theory or whatever, and people found it intellectually appealing, then they simply stuck to it. Even if there was no, and in many cases that's true, even if there was no empirical evidence. This is a little bit contradictory to the scientific method, right? You might start with a hypothesis and you say, well, now let's observe the real world on physics and let's do an experiment and measure. And if you can find supporting evidence for your hypothesis, you probably go back, reconsider the hypothesis, adjust it, or modify it here as it's uh, formulated, and you get the start anew. But in finance, we have many, many instances where people came up with a wonderful, mathematically elegant theory, which has proven by no means useful in practice, but nevertheless, you still find it up until today, maybe 60 years later, in textbooks and applied around the world. Um, that's a little bit sad, but the problem might be that people only have one life and do one PhD, and there's not yeah, too many time to come up with a hundred uh, different hypotheses, and this is what the quote here states from uh, this kind of popular book, uh, The Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos. Machine learning is a scientific method on steroids. It follows the same process of generating, testing, and discarding or refining hypotheses. But while a scientist may spend his or her whole life coming up with and testing a few hundred, I would rather say maybe a few dozen hypotheses, a machine learning system can do the same in a second. Machine learning automates discovery. It's no surprise then that it's revolutionizing science as much as it's revolutionizing business. Maybe in brackets, finance as well. Um, 
It's a little bit similar here what is stated to what I pointed out with regard to the news articles or the financial data, right? So we as human beings, we might be capable of reading on a daily basis, let's say 25 news articles, but a machine can read easily 25,000 news articles. And that's the same here with doing research. We can do that much research. We stand at the blackboard or we use whatever tools we have, but the machine, we know this all can scale, has, I don't know how many compute cores and uh, machine learning is basically, and this is the major message here, the scientific method on steroids, if something doesn't work, the machine does not complain, it goes back and updates the weights or updates whatever it is to be updated with regard to the algorithm. So that's where we are coming from. And uh, starting last year, this was one of the first books, if not the first book, which had both finance and machine learning in its title by Marcos Lopez de Prado. He's both a practitioner having managed billions of dollars as well as a double PhD. So he is both in research or practice as well as in academia. And uh, four quotes that I highlight here following the first is, the essential tool of econometrics is multivariate linear regression, 18th century technology. This that was already mastered by Gauss before 1794. It's hard to believe that something as complex as 21st century could be grasped by something as simple as inverting a covariance matrix. I think this is a pointed statement in the sense that it would last, uh, again, like seven, maybe six decades. Uh, econometrics was driven almost exclusively by the application of ordinary squares regression, which assumes many, many things, linearity and normality of the receivables, and, 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 and it's a long list. Um, and it's, it can only bring you so far. And when we have a look at the financial markets and they've changed over time tremendously, it might be no surprise that indeed um, these tools that are 200 years old maybe, might not be enough to understand, to model what's going on in the market. So non-linearity is a problem, I come to that, or high dimensionality is a problem. Uh, and the conclusion here is econometrics might be good enough to succeed in financial academia for now, but succeeding in practice requires ML. Although I observe, of course, more and more um, machine learning um, pick up in academia as well. Of course, everybody wants to jump here on the train. When we have a look at the markets on the left-hand side, my simple representation X stands for all the data that we have, the tick data, the news, whatever this might be, or political news, you name it, and then the markets act as data processing units and they come out with some results. Let's say there is news with regard to the economy at the same time, Apple releases a new product and the markets consume the new information and then a new Apple price shows up on the ticker. And how this works, yeah, that's the big problem, that's the big question. We can conclude that it's probably non-linear, it's complex and it's changing over time. So in finance, we are not dealing with physics, right? The physical world is supposed to be somehow stable, right? When we discover a physical law, we assume that 10 years, even 100 or 1,000 years from now, the same law should hold true. But in finance, research and financial practice, we can say as well, was driven by brilliant minds, no question here, I'm a big fan of many of the brilliant minds we have in our field. But most of finance was uh, or can be characterized as normative economics. So you typically when, when you read the financial paper, there's the introduction and then there comes something like model as a section header and then they say, let's assume the following. And then there comes a long list of assumptions or if it's more mathematical axioms, etc. And then they say, well, now let's assume that this characterizes our world and then the researcher shows some simple elegant theory, but when the econometricians show up and say, well, now let's test the theory in practice, more often than not, these theories haven't proven that useful. So um, this is what I call brain-driven and beauty myth. So for decades on end, it was kind of the major goal to get your PhD, your tenure as a professor, or even the Nobel Prize in economics, to come up with some simple elegant theory that people like, and uh, again, that's elegant, that maybe even as an MBA student, uh, you understand, apply, even if you are not a math major, 
and say, well, I understand that this is appealing to me and now I can go out in the real world. But I think it's time for a paradigm shift, as they call it. And I would say, well, now that we have the data, if we call the data-driven finance story, data is there, we can access it programmatically. Even on small machines, here my notebook has, I don't know, four cores and 16 gigs of RAM, I can do quite a bit. Let's have a look at the data first, not start pen and paper and assume things. Let's have a look at the data and let's try to figure out relationships and what we see there. Uh, we have now a bunch of algorithms available, general, parametrizable, trainable algorithms, and I'll leave it here general, so not having something specific in mind. And if we are able to apply these algorithms for machine deep learning, etc., to our data, why not go with something that works somehow better, might not be perfect, um, and change from the brain driven beauty myth financial world to the data driven AI first one? Uh, usually what people say, and I agree to that, is that many of the, the models applied to finance are really black boxes. So this raises issue legally, this raises issue with regard to compliance, etc. pp. But for me, as a practitioner running my own company, and if I would invest my own money based on something like that, I would say rather have a black box that makes me decent amount of uh, profit as compared to a theory that I fully understand, but that doesn't help me at all. But these are problems uh, that are there, but I'm uh, confident that it can be solved there as well. Again, Python and the Python ecosystem is well positioned. I would say that Python is a first-class citizen in the AI machine deep learning world. Uh, you might need some additional hardware. So when I speak of you can get started with a small notebook, this might bring you that far. But for the big financial institutions that want to implement uh, large scale projects, this might be a little bit of a different story. So now that we say, well, data is there, we can access it with a few lines of Python code, why APIs, um, AI can be applied because data is there and Others in other fields have had tremendous success in applying, let's say, deep learning to certain problems. Think self-driving cars, whatever, recommender engines, Netflix, um, or search engines, Google, etc. So why not try to do it here as well? So therefore, the, the big questions, and this is what I'm concerned with. So there are many, many different application areas of machine learning and finance. I think also quite a few success stories, um, but they might not be in my direct field. So I'm more interested in the capital market side, so in trading, algorithmic trading, and one of the major questions, uh, questions is there, are markets predictable? And for me, that's the holy grail, and for many others as well. So if I'm able to predict the markets, I might not only become a rich man, this might also bring me some fame and whatever. It's similar to going to the casino, and you know, when you play roulette, it's like a 50-50 chance, black and and um, and red now neglecting the zero, the green. Um, although in German casinos, for example, you get back your bet when zero shows up. Um, you would assume that in a perfect world, the chance, the probability is 50% to see black and red. But what happens if, for whatever reason, and there are examples in history, uh, you will be able to say with some confidence uh, to derive it that maybe red in this particular casino shows up 55% of the time. Of course, you would, um, in general, if not always, bet on red, right? So this is what we try to do. We have basically a baseline, which would say 50-50, market goes up or down. Um, this holds true in particular for mean rewarding quantities like currency quotes or commodity prices, let's say. It might not hold true 200% um, for drifting ones like stock prices, indices. Uh, but let's think of this simple game, 50-50 or the toss of a coin, 50-50, that would be a baseline. In that sense, I would consider the markets a uh, similar game, market can go up or down. And we are now concerned with regard to can we beat the baseline. And there's so many people out there still today that make use of technical analysis. So trying to spot a certain price formation, and here you see some 8, 16, 20, 20 different ones. The first eight about a bullish pattern, 
the assumption is that whenever you see such a pattern, the market is supposed to go up. Nobody says to 100%, but with a higher probability, the market should go up. This is the 55% or 60% case. The, other, the next eight, when you spot these patterns, then the probability is assumed to be higher that the market goes down. So you would probably short the instrument or you would not be positioned at all. And then you have reversal patterns. So there are many, many more, it's not just these. So I, I out of interest, I, I recently bought a German book and they had like, this looks like astrology to me. I don't know what they did, like geometrical arguments, whatever. I didn't try to go deeper into that. I, I rather uh, use machines to do it. But believe me, there are so many different things there uh, that people try to use to beat the market. So uh, the assumption here is that the markets are predictable because if I believe in something like that, I assume implicitly that markets are predictable. Um, but if you have a look, we are, I'm a wonder, that's one of our trading platforms that we deal with. And whenever I log in and look something up, I see like updated information. And uh, the basic message here is CFDs are complex instruments, blah, blah, blah. And now comes the number. 73.5% of retail investor accounts lose money when trading CFDs with this provider. So the majority of accounts loses money. And they, I wouldn't say all, but the large uh, part of this uh, crowd applies, among others, technical analysis. So this is what people believe, and this is reality. So I would call this a myth. Maybe there's, uh, there are people out there that say, well, for me it works, but for the majority, obviously it does not work. Then normality. Normality of returns. This is something you find all over the place in the financial industry. And it basically started in the 50s, 1951, when Mark, uh, um, Mark, Harry Markowitz came out with his portfolio selection approach, where he said, well, now let's get rid of reading the newspapers, let's get of, uh, rid of uh, having some assumptions about whatever. We need to put this on a quantitative ground. And this is fantastic, because this is basically the first quant model it was ever there. And um, it reduced the whole investment process to just analyzing the mean variance of a portfolio based on the expected mean return of single stocks, the expected, we must say, uh, standard deviation and the covariance or the correlation between the single stocks. So for the first time, this whole investment procedure was moved towards a completely quantitative grounding. And when I say that the only thing that is relevant is the mean and the variance or the standard deviation of the distribution, then implicitly at least I assume some normal distribution. Because only the normal distribution is completely defined by the first two statistical moments. Many other things, other distributions, higher moments that are as relevant or even more relevant. Well, we have a look at theory and practice. On the left, this is a QQ plot. I don't know if you're used to this plot. Um, it's often used to analyze uh, returns here with regard to their normality characteristics. On the left-hand side, you see what theory assumes that all these blue dots, uh, simply speaking, lie on the red line. But in practice, what we see is that we have what is called fat tails. So we have more higher positive returns and more lower negative returns than we would expect from a normal distribution. Um, and this is, of course, an important, um, an important aspect. But nevertheless, finance is driven to a large extent by this normality. So, and many other examples can be mentioned, like the famous black scholes merton model with a geometric Brownian motion. Returns of the geometric Brownian motion are also normally distributed. So I can go on and on and on. Myth number three is linearity. So many, many models, and this starts here with the uh, capital asset pricing model. Uh, Journal of Finance, this is in the 60s already, September 64, uh, where there is also implicitly assumed that normality. So this now adds some more to the normality assumption. Um, it is the linearity between different parameters here. So you see here the capital market line, you see here a linear, uh, a linear line. Uh, these days, this is the original chart. These days, 
typically you would have the return on the ordinate um, and uh, the risk on the other axis. So, but nevertheless, as you see here, the linearity and the equation here, uh, not going into details, just mentioning um, like the major myths that we have in our beauty myth world and finance. I write in my new book quite a large deal about these things and show Python-based examples that allow you to verify this on your own. So now we come to something that let us conclude that markets might not be predictable after all. So this is also from the 60s where the discussion about random walks and stock markets emerged and was discussed over decades. And basically what this uh, theory says is that stock prices are random walks and basically to keep things simple, this says it's indeed a 50-50. So we can't tell whether the market goes up or down because it's random and it's 50-50. And when you uh, read here uh, through the later parts, um, it says, for example, we shall see later that if the random walk theory is an accurate description of reality, then the various technical or chartist procedures, recall my picture of the 20 different patterns, uh, for predicting stock prices are completely without value. So this is what the efficient market, as it's also called hypothesis or the random walk um, hypothesis suggests that don't even try, don't even bother. Skip that part, become a passive investor, sleep for 20 years, wake up and reap the benefits. So that's what the uh, random walk hypothesis suggests. And if you apply, usually I show this as well, like. Uh, ordinary stress regression and try to predict um, stock price behavior, you will see that, um, yeah, technically speaking, the best predictor of tomorrow's price is today's price in a least square sense. But it says, well, the market is always right, quote unquote, in the sense that the current price is the right one. There is no meaningful way in saying it should be higher or it should be lower. It is the price. Therefore, trying to predict something is worthless as we see here. And now we see the efficient market hypothesis in action. There is a whole industry, the hedge fund industry, which spends millions and millions, if not billions, in aggregate per year in research, technology, trading, uh, people, whatever, in order to beat the markets. And this is what I get paid for, right? The 220 model, 2% 2 management fee, 20% performance fee. This has all come down a bit, but this is the standard uh, or the reference model still. And this is the analysis. These are the numbers from 2018. Key hedge fund facts this is from a company called Prequin. And when you go to the slides, you can click on that. You see that, or, or you can access the full, the full article. It's just like a two page one. This is the summary here. So the all strategies hedge fund benchmark finished the year at minus 3.42%, the worst performance since. When your losses are widespread, 20% of funds saw losses between 0 and 5%, while 40% saw their losses exceed 5%. So the hedge fund industry, which is supposed to generate alpha to outperform typical benchmarks and, after all, to get some positive returns, some profits, uh, on aggregate loses money. So for me, this is, if not evidence, but it hints towards yeah, the validity of the efficient market hypothesis. You can invest, you can use huge resources, huge funds, and nevertheless, as an aggregate field, the hedge funds are not able to come up even with a positive return here in this particular year. This is not true for every year, but with the effort they put in, you would expect this to be true every year. So, my point of view, that's kind of support for the run the walk hypothesis. And of course, you will always, every year you will have given the sheer numbers. There are thousands of hedge funds active. You see, you have 15,947 hedge funds, um, 2017, just a few less in, in 2018. Out of all these, of course, you will see companies that really do great. Like in that particular year, there were a couple of funds that did plus 50%, plus 40%, right? That's amazing. But it's just like two hands full out of 15,000 that do that well. 
So, but these are typically the ones that you see then on the covers of the financial magazines. Now, what about machine and deep learning to the rescue? Might there be anything to it? So here I'm just quoting uh, a slide that I typically use in a different context. It's, um, it's a mathematical paper about the um, universal representation theory. Um, here a quote of that. The mathematical theory of artificial neural networks is universal. Approximation theory states that the feed-forward network with a single hidden layer, so it's, so to say, a small one, a small one in terms of number of layers, containing a finite number of neurons can approximate continuous functions on compact subsets of RN. Doesn't say that it's a small network in terms of units, but a small network in terms of layers, and this is already power, 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 powerful. So it's universal representation theory. And you can do much, much more with such a shallow neural network, single hidden layer, than you can do with any kind of ordinary least square regression. And the, the assumption, the hope is that when I apply this powerful tool, this mega powerful tool to financial data, maybe there's something in it. And I have now a quick live demo. I won't go into details. It's rather about the charts, the plots that show up. But basic question is now, can machine learning algorithms beat typical investment trading benchmarks? And I have come up here with three benchmarks that I want to uh, uh, use. It, it's long only. So typically, let's say I trade futures on the S&P 500. I could, of course, buy ETF, the SPY ETF, and, and just be a passive investor over time. Or when I trade futures, I can take long and short positions um, one other benchmark I recently use regularly is short only. I, I'm the contrarian. I'm always short, whatever. And then I have random positions where I simply say, well, I don't do predictions. I simply draw random numbers using NumPy random. And uh, I say, well, this is like the monkey thing. You might not recall this. A Wall Street Journal uh, throwing darts at the journal. And we all recall these stories, right? The monkey usually won against uh, seasoned professionals. So interactive demo. Jupyter Notebook, you have access to that as well. So here, and again, thank you, Paul, for all the good work for Jupyter Notebook. Without it, I couldn't live anymore. So, um, are markets predictable? So for, this is now using data from Wanda. So we are Wanda users and um, just importing a bunch of, and I have uh, retrieved from the API, so in order to save time, I have saved that on disk. And this is now over three month period. Uh, what did I choose here? Yeah, the second interval here, June to September, 2019. I'm using Euro US dollar, me rewarding quantity. Um, I want to later on do directional predictions. Um, I work with a granularity of 10 minutes. Um, yeah, that's basically it. three months worth of 10 minute data. So we have data typically Monday morning until Friday night. So it's, uh, it's not really 24 seven. It's somehow close to, um, 24 five. Some, not exactly with Rwanda. So that's the data to get a rough idea of the data that we have It's some 9,358 data points and we have open, high, low, close values. I'm just going with the, with the close price here. And uh, I'm calculating the lock return, and I also generate um, a binary feature. It's also my label, rather label. I don't use it as a feature. It's my label here, data D, and this is just like up or down. So I transform my lock return into one when the lock return is positive and zero when the lock return is negative. So it's my binary label. I just want to, I'm just interested in whether the market goes up or down. That's enough in general. If we are good at that, again, the red black example at roulette, that's okay. I'm not interested whether 37 or 25 shows up. If I get the color right with a, with a high probability, that should be okay. So now the benchmarks where I simply say um, my long strategy is just uh, the market return here, Euro US dollar, my short benchmark is just minus that and my random positioning here, I take positions minus one and one randomly times the market return. So I simply switch back and forth just to have like another baseline benchmark there. 
length of data is shown here. I split here in training, validation, test data, and I work with lagged data. I have normalized my returns here as features, and I work with lagged return features. And I normalize this based on the training uh, statistics, mean standard deviation, and I use this as part of the model. So I take the mu and standard deviation from training for all the data sets that I have. So I have five lags, you see here, five lags for the test data set. And my basic idea now is to use these five lags. I'm not working with something that I shouldn't know. I'm allowed to know that. And I try to predict D, the, the direction. It's like pattern-based trading, right? So we try to learn about historical behavior and try to come up with prediction, predictions about future behavior. So first, um, standard uh, bagging uh, classifier here with a decision tree, base estimator. Um, you see the parameters there, nothing really uh, special. I train it. Here you see the calls. These are my five legs, like one, two, three, four, five. Normalized return data, uh, D is the directional data. And the, uh, the accuracy of the model is 54%. And I can assure you, if you would have a 54% probability when you go to a casino that red turns up after a relatively short while, if you get the capital management, the money management correct, you will be a very, very rich person. So in the financial markets, we always have to deal with stuff like transaction costs, etc. So I'm currently neglecting that. So I more assume like a, a casino-like environment where I have my chips and I bet on the one or the other side. Then I do the prediction here on the test data. So the prediction on the test data and transform my predictions, which are 0, 1 to minus 1 and 1. So my positions are short, minus 1 and 1 long for my binary um, label data set. Now the position is taken. So my algorithm, my trained algorithm, says if you should go 2,687 times short and 1,051 times long. So this is on the test data set. You recall we had some 9,500 points, and this is now the test data set. The number of trades, and this is now where the transaction cost would become pretty, pretty relevant, is 12,061. So in finance, we would rather like to have let's say the first two-thirds just short and then long, this will be one trade. But you see, uh, there are many, many trades taking place where the position is shifted. So it's not every interval, but it's, it's um, happen, happening pretty often. So transaction costs would be considerable. Now I calculate, given the positions, my returns. And when I have a look you now graphically here at the returns, we see the following. We have here towards the end, that's the relevant part. Um, we have the long, short, and random benchmark. So long is going down here, you see. It's from starting at one, it's normalized. It, it loses somehow money over the test period. Short, accordingly, because it simply reverses it, gives me some positive return. Uh, the random one is in between, so it's somehow, you see, might be something or not, it's just a random one. But the machine learning one here ends up indeed with close to plus 4%. And if we could achieve that, again, neglecting uh, transaction costs and then putting in a leverage of 10, let's say, we have an outperformance of 50 percentage points when we assume a leverage of 10. Again, transaction costs will eat that up. But we are only talking about whether markets are predictable or not. And here, to some extent, they seem predictable. I would rather go here with my red line, the strategy itself, than with the other one. Now, deep learning is the name of the game in many areas, so I uh, show you the same example now based on scikit-learn with a uh, deep neural network, two hidden layers, 192 um, hidden units per layer. Um, API is the same. Fortunately, with scikit-learn, I do the prediction based on the positions. Just a quick look. You see, the numbers change already. So 
Uh, here, the, the, the multi-layer perceptron classifier doesn't go short as often as the other one, but we don't know whether this is good or bad, so we can't tell. The number of trades is similar, calculating the strategy returns, and we can add this to the mix. And now the, uh, the final one is always the darkest one, given my color palette, so the, just what I did, this is the red one in the middle, and this is also outperforming our benchmarks. Unfortunately, the random one now <laughs> turns somehow uh, white here in the, in the chart. Um, and the uh, bagging classifier is still the best performing one. If we, if we are just concerned with regard to what we have at the end. Of course, for such a strategy, other, other uh, metrics will be of importance as well, like drawdown, etc. Last but not least, just to show that it works with others as well, I use Keras DNN, um, Deep Neural Network, a simple feed-forward neural network, uh, nothing specific, um, 128 per layer, and I fit it with the validation data. Here's the first instance where I use the validation data directly. Training takes a bit, 50 epochs, one the major advantage from my point of view of using Akira's in this context is that I can easily access all the performance metrics um, afterwards. So this is what we now see there. We get access for every single training uh, iteration, every epoch here to the validation loss, the validation accuracy, the loss and accuracy in sample on the training data set. And I can visualize that of course here. And this is now a typical thing, what we see in finance with regard to financial data. In sample, in particular with the deep neural network, you see I can go arbitrarily accurate. So I can, if the, the network is large enough, I can, uh, I can reach uh, close to 100%. Uh, maybe I'm limited by the power of my machine, actually, but uh, we saw the universal approximation theory. And in that sense, you see the purple line here, the accuracy goes up, up, up more or less linear, but the validation accuracy doesn't go up. So universal approximation doesn't speak about generalization of a trained model, nor about the predictive power of such a model. Uh, it just says, with regard to approximation, I can get pretty close. We also see the loss coming down, but the validation loss goes up. So this is pretty typical. In sample, I can go up, 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 up and out of sample. It doesn't go too bad here, I must say, so the validation still is okay, but at some point we for sure will run into major overfitting issues. So the performance itself, we can evaluate it. Here we have an accuracy of 52.4% and translate it into our positions. Numbers are similar, but not the same. And here I'm now going to uh, show the numbers. So the DNN strategy here outperforms the others 4.4% plus and relative to the others, this is now the net thing, so long here is put to zero, so that's our benchmark and we have outperformance of 5.7 percentage points. But again, you saw the number of trades here, 790 trades, so quite a bit of quite a bit of transaction costs that we would need to take into account. So that's where we go. And this is a pretty interesting chart because it more or less goes continuously up. There is not a major drawdown to be seen, which is something people would like to have. So sometimes you get results where you have an end performance that is kind of good, okay, amazing, whatever, but in between you might see larger drawdown periods, which is uh, what people typically want to avoid. But here in the end we would say, well, this is not proof for yeah, the, the superiority of machine learning or deep learning algorithms, the prediction of markets, but there might be something to it. So out of sample, I'm here in a position to be able to, uh, to uh, predict my market in a way that I outperform my three benchmarks. Maybe there are other benchmarks, but I couldn't come up with uh, that many more sensible benchmarks here in this case. I, I wouldn't use, let's say, the S&P 500 as a benchmark for a Euro-US dollar trade, right? So this is not the benchmark. This might be for uh, an 
active um, stock portfolio, the benchmark, but here long short and a random benchmark and maybe the other, the other algorithms present natural benchmarks here as well. So there might be something to it. Again, I'm not saying that this is kind of proof for it, but for sure this gives us uh, a little bit of a hope that the machine learning algorithms can do better in the markets than the traditionally applied uh, multivariate ordinary squares regression models. So yes or no, it's up to you to come up with your own conclusion. I'm hopeful, but I'm still not convinced. The AI machine. Now you might say, well, what about the AI machine? What is this project? I said a couple of words before, but maybe now a little bit of a closer look. So let's say you have attended our scientific program in Python for algorithmic training. And there you see some stuff similar to what I've shown before. Retrieve financial data, you transform it in a way that you have proper features, in a way that you have labels, you get started applying different algorithms, uh, you come up with good prediction results, you trust in your back testing results, as we say in finance, and you say, now, so what? So I want to trade that. I believe in it, I want to trade it. What does it entail? Yeah, algorithmic trading then would start, let's say, with data, your yes dollar, one minute bars, whatever the time frame is, features and labels, time series features, you might include economic indicators, in particular when you trade like uh, currencies, direction and movement might be the target, as I did. Machine learning, maybe you rely on standard ones, like kernel-based ones, support vector machine, then I classify, you train and test, you validate, you come up with you know, something that makes you hopeful, as I am. You vectorize, you use vectorized backtesting, maybe event-based backtesting. This is something we currently start working on. You visualize, you say, well, I've mastered it all. And then the big part comes here, deployment. I need to transform my algorithms into online algorithms. I need to deploy it in the cloud. I need to do monitoring and risk management. So that's the big deal. The other stuff yeah, can be mastered. Uh, I'm pretty confident when you, for example, go through our 16-week programs, um, then you should be able to master the first four, but we can only get that far with the fifth one there. And the AI machine is indeed something that should cover the whole thing. There. Data must come from some other place. We are no data providers, but we help with creating features and labels, with the training, with the backtesting and the deployment. So this is basically what the AI machine is about. Standardized deployment of AI-powered algorithmic trading strategies. And here you see a screenshot and I can show you, unfortunately, I, usually I do a live demo, but um, the problem is it's Sunday and Wanda doesn't trade on Sunday, so we can't trade there, so it's simply due, uh, it's, it's a fact that uh, I can't show it live, but I can show you how it looks um, theoretically. So we use Jupyter Notebook, once again here, to um, allow people, us currently, to define the strategies. And I said before, and this is roughly accurate, I would say, 150 lines of code for the strategy, but 15,000 lines of code for the deployment. So here is a strategy, it's a class which inherits from our class. This is actually a bagging classifier, as I used as my first example. That's the reason why I added bagging to the story there. And when I go down, down, there are features in the middle. Here are features defined. And I just want to show you the number, so it's not 150, but with the, with the empty rows, you see here it's some 184. So it's not huge. That's the strategy. This is what people well versed in Python, data science, financial data science, algo trading can come up with. And the platform now is supposed to allow you that you say, well, this is my strategy definition. We have also kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, detailed logging and, and exceptions that we uh, catch and so forth, so because we allow users lots of flexibility, this brings lots of problems, as you know. Here we have the bagging model, which I have back tested, and there you can access logs and it shows exactly what the code has done. So, back testing is not the, the big deal. So, there are many other platforms which do a great job with regard to back testing, to name a few, it's Quantopian. It's uh, Quant Connect, and many others allow you to do backtesting. And here we have what I call confirmatory backtest. And I'm opening this to show you 
something related to my transaction cost argument. You see here, if you would assume that all this is true and reflects reality, you see here the green line, the model returns before TC, and you see the red line. Even if you have fantastic results, plus 70% over a relatively short period of time, after transaction cost, this might be nothing or even go south. Due to the fact, as we've seen before, that you might have 1,200, 1,500 trades for a relatively short period of time, and transaction costs are a fact of life. So we cannot neglect them. And here you see the impact. The red line is after transaction costs, and the green one is before. So good backtest result in the theoretical sandbox world, but not as good anymore in the real world where we need to pay for every trade. But this is just one element that I wanted to highlight here. The major element is that I have defined a Jupyter Notebook with my class, a trading strategy. This is what I backtest here, but this is where all the other platforms stop. What we have is now this single button, and I used to say within minutes you can deploy a strategy, actually it's within seconds. I click on go live. And usually I show this live but I can't show it because there's no trading taking place. The API is that, so to say. I say here what quantity to trade, stop loss distance, take profit, etc. Uh, I provide a bunch of parameters, can't go into details here, hedge parameters. So when I'm done here, I click on add model and the model is traded. So this is a matter indeed of seconds. If you agree with all the default parameters, they can be saved then you deploy the strategy immediately. And then here are the live models. Um, let me quickly search that one where I had the, uh, the oh yeah, yeah, that's the one here. I'm explicitly looking for that because the screenshot here is from the one that I'm going to show you. So this is from this week where the model, the backend classifier made some 4.37% plus over um, a period of three and a half hours, which is excellent. It doesn't work always that way. This would be too nice. Uh, but this is the screenshot, and I can now show you this slide. So when I click on that, and what I show you now as a, let's say, static representation works in real time as well. So when the trades are, let me decrease this a little, little bit. The resolution here is excellent. Um, so this runs in real time when the trading is taking place. So you see, uh, would see on the right hand side as new tick data flows in. And what you see there is that the first prediction was an upwards movement, triangle pointing upwards. The model went long. Then we have what is called um, um, uh, position offload. When we have reached a certain threshold, we halve the position. So we capture like the profits. Then it goes short. This was a right signal. Whenever the signal is green, you see, uh, this was a correct prediction. We went short, we made some money. We went long, we made some money. This is like almost a perfect one, right? It went short, makes some money, long, makes some money. Here, position offload and profit capture. So here, trailing stop loss kicked in. And there is the downward pointing triangle. This means the forecast was down, but um, the market went up, but no problem because we haven't been positioned there. So, by luck, and that's the reason why we pause. We pause later on. Um, we didn't lose anything. And then we have here the final prediction, and shortly afterwards, this was A correct, and B, there was the position offload and the, pro uh, the, the profit capture. So this is the graphical representation, all interactive and updated in real time. Here you see the lock as well, with regard to what has happened, at which price, slippage, and all these information you can export that and analyze it. You can, this is something we just recently added. Here there's also a detail lock um, that you can access which shows you everything that might be of relevance when th something happened, which features data points have been used, etc. So from the definition of the strategy to the backtesting with the same code, within seconds you deploy the strategy and it's executed um, in real time and we hope robustly and reliably. This brings me um, already to my final slide and I have put this at the very end because it's so important. It represents like uh, hard learning uh, for us. 
Um, and uh, I recently listened to the audiobook, which is called uh, Prediction Engines. And there I realized that what we have been working on and looking for is something that is not only true in our field, but it's true in many, many other fields as well. The machine learning side is one part. So to come up with predictions, I think we can master that. You saw we had like a prediction accuracy of 83% in this smaller, shorter example. This works kind of okay. Statistical methods, machine learning, deep learning, whatever we, we use here, and the deployment part is rather hard technical work. So to deploy it, to set it up robustly, but, and this is, I can't even point you to a single source in the form of a book or tutorial or whatever, where people speak explicitly about the right hand side. And in the book, Prediction Engines, which has nothing to do with finance or trading, but generally speaking, uh, addresses the problem. They say, well, prediction is one part, but decision rules are the other one. So this is similar to self-driving cars. Even if the prediction is to turn left, you must have some safety measures built in, which check whether there is some other car coming up front or whatnot, whether they are pedestrians or whatnot. And this is what we have in finance as well. We have all these decision rules, and they are plentiful, like entry rules, stop loss, training stop loss, dynamic stop loss, take profit, position size, and capital allocation. This is what we have been working on tremendously. And this is when I say prediction is just one side of the coin. Market realities, transaction costs, are uh, as important, at least as important, because they can eat up all your lunch. But what is at least equally important to the prediction are the decision rules. And this is the hard part. This leads to skews. This yeah, might decide whether you strive or whether you lose. So uh, when I ask the questions, are markets predictable, even if you come up with a strong, strong yes, it doesn't guarantee that it can make money out of that. You need to have the right deployment, the right implementation, and I think um, we still have a way to go, but we have hopefully discovered a few things that help us in doing it. And again, here, all these POs, POs, PCs, these are all the decision rules. Only the L and S are driven by the predictions. The rest, what you see, the, the other flags, they are based on the decision rules. So we have a long way to go still, but we have come a long way already. And I'm pretty excited that um, we can apply these days uh, all the fantastic Python tools as well as the AI machine learning approaches to our field. And I'm excited to be part of the way from traditional finance to data-driven finance and AI-first finance. And having said that, I hope you will be as well and say thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for if to give us a uh, wonderful speech. And uh, because of time, uh, I select a popular uh, Slido question to ask if, have you seen successful application of Python algorithm in marketing, uh, in making multiple predictions, supposedly what forms like British water is up to? Yeah, seen is a good question. Of course, um, there's hardly any area maybe beyond uh, the intelligence community that is as secretive as the hedge fund industry. So I have had the chance to speak to some teams from hedge funds that work on AI applications, um, not with Bridgewater, but I want to argue with regard to the macro prediction on a rather general level. So we all know for the application of most algorithms, particular deep learning neural networks, um, we need lots of data, lots and lots of data. By definition, by nature, macroeconomic data is small, small, small. It's the same as end of day data or even smaller. So many macroeconomic data points that you have are maybe on a quarterly, half year or even only yearly basis. And I doubt that you will get to some reliable, robust prediction engines in this regard, given the small amount of data that we have there. But on the other hand, if you get this halfway right, you might have a tremendous advantage in this regard. But I see 
personally, the problem of data availability and data volume, so to say, uh, in the application of machine deep learning to, um, to macroeconomic forecasts. This is not about macro trading or macro strategies, but when we talk about macroeconomic predictions, then I would be doubtful whether this works out too well. And the second uh, question is, if AI can predict the stock price, then everyone will be rich? Yeah, I think I tried to address this, um, I tried to address this towards the end. The prediction part is only halfway through. You can have a model, and many people approach me and say, well, I have prediction accuracy of 75%. This still doesn't guarantee you anything. Only in the roulette world, where there are no transaction costs, and you can bet what you like, this will work. But the financial markets are different. So um, be aware of equating 75% prediction accuracy with becoming a billionaire. You can, depending on how you trade and what your rules are and your capital sizing, let's say, and money management rules, you can have a model which has 45% accuracy, but if the model gets the largest, the biggest movers correct, the big upwards movement and the big downwards movement, then you might become a billionaire. Because you will live only of the big movements and not when you get some tiny movements correct. This is for trading not enough. Tiny movements typically are not enough on the level that I was showing to even earn your transaction costs. And uh, sorry, uh, the reason. So uh, the last question, uh, why did you choose the mouse uh, on your book's title page uh, on Python of finance? Actually, it's not a mouse. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I again forgot the English name. In German, it's a Schlitz, or so you find it in middle America. It's um, an animal that you don't see that widespread across the world. Uh, but it was the second or third email that I exchanged with O'Reilly, where they said, well, we can debate anything but the animal. Um, O'Reilly has a marketing team, and uh, they're almost running out of animals. As I was told, uh, I'm rather looking forward to the animal for my next book, AI and Finance. But there was no discussion where I was involved. They simply came up with it. And my assumption was that the animal is close enough to the, the pretty well-selling book at the time of Wes McKinney, uh, Python for Data Analysis. Um, but I haven't been involved in that decision at all. I need to live with it. Uh, okay, and thanks for uh, Eve's speech, this uh, keynote, and that's we got a, a big clap for him. Thanks very much, guys.